well, first speaker is the Brian Fat. Uh, he's a uh, he has been participating in our activities since the beginning. So, uh, please. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. I was saying, in, in retrospect, maybe we should have just started at nine, so we had a little bit more time to discuss. But I know people, of course, like they have um, a little bit of a break as well, too. Um, anyways, yeah, thank you, Matteo. This is my second time at one of these workshops. And it's really a pleasure to be here and to have such an international and interdisciplinary group together. So I am um, typically based at Towson University in Baltimore, right, out, uh, right outside of Baltimore during the academic year. But I spend the summers at, uh, in, outside of Vienna at IASA. And so um, yeah. So a lot of what I'm going to say is, has kind of been touched upon in different ways today. And as I, as I was going through the slides, I thought I won't take out those slides. I'll just go quickly through them. But I wanted to keep my storyline more or less intact as well, too. Um, so one of the things about IASA, I'll just put this out there real quickly, is that we run a summer uh, research program, three months. PhD students can come. We get 50 PhD students from around the world. So if you have any PhD students, typically advanced PhDs, but um, really any PhD students can apply for this. Applications are always mid-January for the upcoming summer. So obviously we're, in, we're set for this summer, but um, keep that in mind. It's a really great opportunity to come and work with IASA scientists and spend three months in Vienna. So that's one program. Um, so yeah, when I was uh, you know, asked to, to come to this, you know, collective agency is not my main area of research. And I just thought I, I'll do a little personal brainstorming and just write down some key words that come to mind with collective agency and collective action. And these were some of the things that I came up with. As you can see, quite a few of these have already been touched upon today. And, um, and I'm going to try to weave a story more or less around these different, different key words. So starting with worldviews and the mental models that we um, make in order to determine how we understand and make sense of the world, right? So I think that's the first starting point. And this has come up already today, is how we construct what we see. If it fits our model, we're more likely to see it. If it doesn't fit our model, we throw it away, right? So we have this implicit bias on how we approach information. Um, another way to think about that is how we make sense of the world. Uh, we can argue all day, and this is as a physics theoretical institute, we could probably have a good conversation, but is there really a reality out there? I would even say in our context it doesn't matter because we are making a model of that reality. And so um, we only know the world through our models. We each have an independent, we have, a, we have kind of a general symbolic species level model, but we always have a, also have an individual model that filters or corrupts, but not corrupts in an evil way, but corrupts in terms of distorting the actual reality is out there. So we will never know that reality because we can only know it through our filter. Um, and then, you know, constructivist thinking perspective basically says the same thing, that there is reality is not something given, but an effective cognit cognitive construction. Uh, we produce our reality by producing system environment distinctions, and thus reality emerges as an effect of the operational closure of the systems. This is a, a biography about Nicholas Luhmann's work. Um, by, by Mueller, which I found very useful. Um, easier than reading the original source material of Nicholas Luhmann, which I would also like to do. This has come up earlier, too, was this idea that we don't have absolute uh, or, or even really knowable uh, desires. And René Girard, a French philosopher, has put together this idea of mimetic rivalries, basically saying that our wants are socially constructed in competition with others. So we only think we want something because we see somebody else wanting that something. And so we're always comparing ourselves um, in terms of, of relative, not in terms of absolutes. OK, so we all have this bias. We have this worldview. We have this paradigm, this perspective. And, um, and we are also making this claim in, in, a, in our book, which I'll have a slide about later, since that also seems to be the thing, um, where we say that the, you know, the dominant science paradigm actually works against the environment. Um, it's, it blocks progress towards sustainability. And in particular, it's because we treat nature as a machine. We treat with this whole idea of mechanism that, that it's, there's a machine out there. Machines wear down. They break down. They run, they run out and so on. Life doesn't do that. Right? Life emerges. It self-organizes. It repairs. It regenerates and all that. So I'm not going to go into that. That's another talk. But that's, um, that's really where at the fundamental core, we think we need to change our paradigm as scientists as well, too. 
And one of those alternatives is the ecological perspective. Um, you know, we know that nature doesn't work like machines. Webs are not machines. And so, so I will make the, the claim that I think ecologists have been somewhat successful at an alternative paradigm. Um, one of my uh, good colleagues, Bob Ulanowitz, talks about process ecology and, and, and looking at it from, from flows and processes as, as opposed to um, you know, parts and machines. Yeah, that was, that was our recent book, Fund Foundations of Sustainability, where we get into this um, quite a bit more. Okay, this is definitely review for this crowd, but just again to keep the storyline going. So what are systems? You know, these are not just random configurations. They're interactions that have some sort of function. Um, I like this quote by Stuart Coffin. The whole exists for and by the means of the parts, and the parts exist for and by means of the whole. We know that from these systems come emergent properties. Also, we've seen definitions of this earlier today that the whole is more than the sum of the parts and that higher order arises from lower level. Everything from a water molecule, you know everything about oxygen and hydrogen independently, that doesn't tell you what water is going to be like. Um, I think a symphony is a good example of that. You can't do harmonies unless you have two, two different voices, right? So there are new sounds that are created in concert. Um, another emergent property is self-organization. We saw several beautiful uh, videos of the starlings and the emergent patterns that, he, that come out there. And we've also had, I think Simon mentioned this, was that um, you know, the, one of the goals, of, or not goals, but one of the um, nice things about emergent properties is that there's no, um, there's no controlling guidance. They just, they just come out, right? They're macroscopic structure that, that comes from the microscopic disorder. But then I was thinking about this, that what we're doing is we're not doing a good job of managing self-organizing processes. That seems a little bit paradoxical, but I think that we can at least try to help and promote self-organizing processes better than we do, or at least not get in the way of them. Um, another one of those ideas of self-organization comes from this, this concept of autocatalysis, also something Bobby Lanowitz writes a lot about. And autocatalysis is simply a positive feedback that moves the system further from thermodynamic equilibrium. It, it creates structures and orders and patterns and processes. So each, each process uh, has a positive influence on the next one. So any little benefit benefits the whole system and it spirals up, but any, any detriment will spiral it down. So these can go in both ways, but, but the idea of self-catalyzing is, is typically the positive reinforcement. And some of the interesting things that come out of this are that that you get that emergence, you get that structure and that order, which actually increases the space overall. So, so I, 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 standard ecological theory talks about niche partitioning. I'm very much a fan of niche emergence and niche um, construction, and that we actually expand our space. And so, so that can be explained through autocatalysis. Um, but also, uh, and this is another one of Ian his, his ideas, was that it's a good way for explaining um, competition. So if you have an autocatalytic cycle, the A, B, C running around there, and another party comes in there like D, um, and we think as an ecologist, D is competing with B. And so there's this competition going on. And you isolate those two out of the context, and you just look at the competition. Well, what D wants to do is be better at helping A and C, fitting in better. So, so competition only exists when there's already a cooperative network to compete to perform into. Right? So cooperation is actually the primary um, uh, interaction type and competition is, is the second one. So again, a Kaufman quote, the function of each task is its role in this whole, right? So it's only doing its thing because it's performing part of a task. This came out earlier today, or this, this conference, right? That, there, that this holistic worldview, you can't really separate the parts, so. Okay, hierarchies, that's definitely a review for this crowd. Um, I do like Kessler's work on holons saying that any part is both a part and a whole simultaneously. So I think that's a, a useful perspective to have about hierarchies. Tragedy of the Commons is also a review uh, that we've talked about today, uh, this, this conference. Um, I think that one of the important parts is the fact that the tragic part of it is not just the environment suffers. The tragic part is that the rational decision makers are being rational. And so that's why if you don't put that extra cow out there or sheep out there, you're the loser, you're the sucker. And so, um, so that's really the tragic part about um, the commons. And, and we're so focused on this fragmentation and this tragedy of the commons, but we do try to introduce this idea that there is a bounty of the commons. There are positive externalities out there. We just tend to, to, uh, to 
have, have removed most of them. And so there's, there's this you know, maybe idealistic way that we can, we can reframe that in having these, these kind of win-win approaches. So I almost said solutions, I call myself. Um, so what are some responses to Tragedy of the Commons? We've already talked about this. Uh, ethics was mentioned earlier. Um, just a precautionary principle, just kind of reprioritizing, that, that can work, right? If we have a common um, uh, agenda that, that, that prioritizes nature. Um, privatizing things. It seems to be one of the common ways that we approach tragedy of the commons. If everyone just has their own piece, they're responsible for their own piece, and that does eliminate some of that. Now, some resources can't be privatized, and we know that, so it's not a universal solution. And it also really doesn't address downstream and off-site impact. So, so it, it, it has its limitations. So what Garrett Hardin proposed, my favorite quote that Simon said like 12 times during his talk, mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. Um, you know, it's interpreted to mean the top-down, democratically imposed um, sanctions that, that everyone agrees to, right? So we're coerced to do something, but we all agree that, that that's the right thing to do. And then Ostrom came along later and said you can also have bottom-up collective actions, um, which is really a mutual coercion mutually agreed upon, but at a local level. I mean, they all had to agree that in those fishing villages they had to agree not to fish on certain places or certain times and so on. So, so I, I, I'm still trying to understand the, the precise difference between the interpretation of Ostrom's work and mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. But, but there's definitely both directions, right? Bottom up and top down. That led me recently to David Stone Wilson's work. I just discovered this maybe a couple years ago and his whole work with the pro-social movement and pro-social world. Um, his website um, has some really interesting information on it and they are also focused all on Ostrom's eight core design principles. So I'm still trying to learn more about this. This is fairly new for me, but I like the quote that Wilson and Wilson have that selfishness beats altruism within groups, but altruistic groups beat selfish groups. So again, it's a scale issue as far as, um, yeah, wh which, is, which is going to uh, be dominant. <clears throat> okay, so that is the precursor to bring me to what maybe is new, and I have not heard this mentioned before. And I'm curious, has anybody heard of cultural theory or theory of plural rationalities in this room? And that's no, a show of zero hands. <clears throat> so Mary Douglas was an anthropologist um, who was, uh, who was trying to find different ways of describing human interactions. This work was picked up on um, by, I don't know if Mike Thompson was ever one of her students or not, but um, worked with her and, and Mike Thompson um, wrote the kind of the seminal book in 1990, Thompson et al. on this. So cultural theory is basically the idea that the hypotheses of, of our worldview will shape our social relations. I mean, it's trivial now because of course that's what social media does, right? We ha hang out with other people that we're like. But back in 1980s and 1990s, this was, this was pretty, pretty revolutionary, I think. Um, and that those social, res, social rev, res relationships then had feedback on our worldviews, right? So there's this reinforcement going on there. <clears throat> so what they did, what their theory proposed, and there's, there's many different ways you can set up typologies. So, so there's always problems and criticisms can be made of any typology. But they, their typology was a group grid Four, uh, four quadrants, two dimensions approach. And they said everybody could be kind of put somewhere on that, on that spectrum. And so there are four different types are the first ones. And the other thing, it wasn't intended to be this way when the theory was first put forward, but it's been very heavily used by the environmental community because the worldviews align so well with your perceptions of environmental risk and your perceptions of, of how you would want to use resources, right? So, so one of them is that the environment is durable, right? It's, it's going to recover. I can do whatever I want. Another one is saying, no, nope, the environment is very fragile. I need to be very careful, and I need to um, you know, have the precautionary principle dominating. And then there's kind of the compromise one that says, well, it's reasonable within limits. Right? You, can, you can mess with it a little bit, but don't cross the thresholds. If only we knew where all the thresholds were. And then the fourth one is the one that unfortunately gets ignored a lot, but is the one that said, hey, it's all a lottery out there. It's capricious. It doesn't really matter what we do because something's going to just pop up unexpectedly, right? So, so these four different <coughs> um, typologies get mapped this way, um, where the one that says it's capricious, so these are the stability diagrams. I think you're familiar with these two. 
um, well, maybe start with the other ones first, was that the, uh, you know, the individualist says that the environment is very stable, so you can knock the system a lot, it's always gonna come back to its stable point, right? So this is the, environment inter or the environment's response to your perturbations, essentially. The egalitarian says it's very fragile, you push it at all, you blow on it lightly, it's gonna fall off and not return to that place. The hierarchist has the reasonable within limits, and the fatalist says you're just on a flat plane and the ball is rolling wherever it happens to be rolling. Um, so this is how you can conceptualize the, um, the uh, interactions or the, or the world views in terms of nature. And then there's lots of cartoons that go with this, but like the fatalist, yeah, whatever will be, will be. Um, the hierarchists have a lot to do with institutions and governance and expert opinions and, um, you know, kind of, you know, you know, take charge kind of approach. The individualist um, is, is the homo economist model, more or less, which is saying that, um, you know, pro-market, you know. So this has to do with a particular thing about flooding, right? Well, people will build, uh, will know not to build on the floodplain or, or kind of the gated community approach, which we already talked about earlier today, buying buying your way out of the problem. And then the other one, the egalitarian approach, is the one that focuses more on, um, yeah, I don't like the word moralistic. They always throw that in there, but kind of more holistic or natural approaches to management. Um, and, and it does, I think, map nicely into this then, that if you think about what you have control over. Do you have control over nature or do you have control over yourself? The hierarchy says you control both, right? Again, you're the, you're the compromiser. Right? You can take some from nature, but you can also you know, modify yourself. The individualists are, my needs are fixed. I gotta have this, I need to have this. But nature can be managed and manipulated. Um, the egalitarian says nature is, is out there and needs to be protected. I can always have behavioral change in order to satisfy you know, a, a lower demand if needed. And again, the fatalist is out there. It doesn't really matter. So what's interesting about these is that there have been quite a few studies done where, like with agent-based models, and you give these different typologies and you let them interact in a space, but typically the fatalists are left out of these studies because they're seen as reactive and not proactive. I think that's a mistake, because I actually think there's some pretty good evidence that maybe not a majority, but a, a plurality of people are probably fatalists. Um, and I think that's how you shift these, these kind of majorities, that you, if you get the fatalists in your camp, then, um, and I think autocrats are very good at, at, at manipulating fatalists, but that's, that's um, just speculation on my part. But um, so, so oftentimes what's happened is that these three different voices are given roles in a model, so at least it's not just one. It's not just homo economicus. It's, it's the other two are thrown in there as well too, and then you can see how, how the, the resource um, will play out. So Mike Thompson's more recent book was this idea of clumsy solutions that's why that was in my title, was that his, his proposition is that any decision made with only one voice will be bad. That you need to have all the voices present and therefore it will be clumsy, it won't be elegant, but you will get a better um, acceptance or outcome because you're listening to all the different voices. Um, yeah, uh, we have, nobody's mentioned this before and I was gonna take these out as well too, but I think it's important, Holling's uh, adaptive cycle which looks at growth, um, e ecological like succession. Oops, that was, where am I looking? Yeah, so the R to K stage. Actually, I really like the slides we heard yesterday with the, uh, the, the wimpy and the, uh, and the obnoxious and the mellow, right? So I'm mapping that onto here, I think, fits well too. But then what Holling added was the uh, omega, the collapse phase, and the alpha, the reorganization phase. And so I think a lot of system, Dynamics can be modeled using this, this metaphor of these four different, four different stages. Um, so we've reoriented a little bit about it, but one of the things that, to keep in mind about this is the, the, the prominence that it gives to the release phase, right? That's usually, uh, again, like seen as a failure of the system, but there's a lot of literature out there that talks about the release phase, the collapse is actually beneficial because it's the opening of space for new things all the way back to the Austrian School of Economics, right? So I'm, I'm dissing on that on one side, but then quoting them on the other. But, um, but yeah, so there are, there are kind of known benefits of collapse in terms of, of opening up the system for new opportunities. Um, and it could look something like this then, right? So you have multiple of these cycles over time, and, and uh, 
maybe it's a projection to think they're always going up, but I think there's evidence in terms of when the system collapses, it doesn't lose everything. There's a seed bank, there's a memory bank, there's something that it can grow on and, and do you know, a little bit better over the long term than it did before. But it, it kind of has to go through that collapse phase in order to relaunch itself. I'm saying that because <coughs> we've talked about this in terms of resilience. Resilience, I know, is a very um, contested word, word as well, too. I mean, we all intuitively know what it means, but how you actually measure or define it. But we came up with this idea that if you can successfully navigate all of those stages of the adaptive cycle, it's not just stopping collapse, but it's being prepared to how to come out of a collapse and reorganize and regrow and then restabilize and so on, that, um, that you're managing your system thinking about all four stages. And actually, the interesting thing about this work was that you can't think one step ahead. When you're in the growth stage, you already need to be thinking about K, omega, and alpha. And when you're in K, you need to be thinking about omega, alpha, and R. Right? So you, you, you've got to have a game plan that prepares you for all of the upcoming stages. All right, so <clears throat> some of the new research then that I'll present, um, working with the postdoc, well, he was a PhD student at the time when he came to Yasa, but then we, we continued this. So this is his PhD research, continue working as a postdoc. Bruno from Brazil, he made a um, uh, ecological model of the Ubatuba, uh, coastal city in Brazil, and it has uh, uh, very complex using the MIMES modeling platform and it was, looks at the uh, different ecosystem services that come from that. And then he linked that up with a, um, a resilient submodel. And um, in particular, that resilient submodel, though, was built on um, Biggs's seven principles, Biggs et al. 2012, which are things like diversity, connectivity, these things in here, slow variables, the complex systems uh, approach, learning, participation, polycentricity. So, so he knows what the system is giving biophysically in terms of the ecosystem services and its function, and then he's feeding that into this resilient submodel. And what was interesting on the first pass, there has to be assumptions about humans inter how humans interact with the model. And in the first pass, he said, well, what if we're all rational decision makers? So the homo economicus approach, and you see that the, the resilience, I think there's just a little bit of startup going on at the, the beginning there, but the... Um, the, the curve goes down over the, over the century and then takes a pretty steep um, hit right at the end of the century. But um, the resilience index is, is decreasing using that. <clears throat> but the follow-up was that he was really interested in this cultural theory. So he said, what if we have different worldviews and we have different interactions with our ecosystem services? And so he recalibrated and we reweighted the priorities of each of those different either resilience principles or also in terms of the ecosystem services. And um, you don't get that much better. <laughs> you get a little bit better. You notice that, though, that the, the red line, the lowest one, was the um, individualist or homo, economic, homo economicus. The, egal the, um, the hierarchist, that middle of the road one, is the blue line that actually performs the best throughout the majority of that simulation. And at the end, the egalitarian is the green line, which is the more environmental <laughs> perspective. <coughs> so. Um, I mean, there's a lot of assumptions that go in this model, and it was just kind of a, a first exploration of this. But one of the things he came up with this idea, well, here's your solution space, right, where you have the compromise between those three, view, three views is that pink shaded area that, um, that you know, where, where they would lie, all three of them. But um, so, so that was part, part of it. But then in a, in a different study, this, this wasn't with Bruno, but um, some of my colleagues in Austria were applying the same thing with... Um, Austria's response to um, the Paris Agreement and the climate change. I see I just have a few minutes left. So, um, so the, the advantage, my, my colleagues in Austria have this huge network map of, of Austria. They've been collecting data for decades now about the interactions. They're, they're social network scientists. And they, um, so here's their, their global map of, of Vienna, which have over 500 different agent, uh, entities or agents. So it kind of blows up. It looks something like this. FAS research is the is the partner, and <coughs> sorry, and what we, we found though, so we, we did different sacred order workshops where we had people with, that were aligned with these different worldviews, and there was some vetting and, and kind of decision making that had to go into that, of course, but we think that was fairly reasonable. The static is the, or I can't even pronounce it, but that is the hierarchist view, the state, um, the egalitarian, 
this is actually this hermit view that I didn't say anything about, but that's all fine. And then the individualists are there. So this particular result is showing you that there was most support for the government interactions. And there was most acceptance that what government does will have the biggest impact on all of us. But there was also the least, the lowest level of, of expected implementation of the government action. So it was the best but least likely to actually take place. Whereas the individualist interaction or, or, or options were, um, had the lowest support, but they thought were the most likely to actually happen. So, that, so that's not necessarily um, good. And the, and the skeptics that were, were there kind of were, were way off the charts, so we won't worry about that. But the really interesting thing I think about this study was that they, they made this like measure of dissent, like how much do you differ from the other person uh, or for, from the other worldviews. And, and the dissent was the highest, as you could imagine, on things like moral values. Um, don't worry about the, the, the units here, but it's, it's relative. But when you started talking about concrete measures, the dissent actually shrank a lot. So even though you have people that identify with these different worldviews and are coming from these different perspectives, as long as you focus the story on what you were going to do, they could find some agreement. As long as they would talk to, well, why are you doing that? They'd start arguing with each other, right? Because they wouldn't be able to agree on, the, on why it was happening. But, but in particular, all the groups actually thought ecological tax reform was okay. Like the business community was okay. They said, well, that will make it fair because if I do, if I want to do green products, then that makes it a more fair playing field than the ones that don't do green products and so on. So, so it was interesting that they, they were okay with the action, but not okay with the, the rationale. They, they weren't doing it now out of the goodness of the environment. They were doing it out of a, a better business model, right? And so, so that, that was, um, I think, one of the first times that this has been shown was that, um, that you can get agreement, you know, just talk about the concrete action. The downside was, of course, like I showed you in the other side, slide, was that they don't think it's going to happen. They think that's one of the least likely things to happen, which is kind of crazy. Maybe they just have this perception that, that, they're, that they're not part of a majority when they actually are. So. Okay, then lastly, I'll just end with um, my homage to um, Danella Meadows and Club of Rome work, right? So Limits to Growth, I think, was, was um, really instrumental in, in shaping how a lot of us think about this. And I always have to show this slide because this was the limits to growth in, in macro scale. And this picture was taken the same year as limits to growth was published in 1972. And it really did help galvanize that environmental movement of everybody seeing in one place, in one picture, all the resources that we actually have. Um, and our little effort towards that was re-spinning it because limits to growth was um, not the best received book in terms of um, policymakers and economists and so on. Um, because it was doom and gloom, and it was depressing, and it was telling us what we can't do. And there was already this message we heard this week is that um, it's, it's much more effective to tell people, to give them an option of what they can do rather than you know, reduce your footprint, shrink yourself, you know, be less. You know, that message doesn't work as opposed to what can you do. Again, back to the ecological worldview is that ecosystems flourish within limits. Ecosystems have constraints of how much solar radiation how much water, how much nutrients, and they, they create you know, elegant, beautiful uh, structures and ecosystems in them. So our, our book now, almost 10 years ago, Flourishing Within Limits to Growth, was a bunch of systems ecologists um, trying to explain how ecosystems do quite well under constraints. Um, <clears throat> we, we, a couple of the co-authors are from Siena, so we called ourselves the Club of Siena, try to uh, play off of that. But, um, yeah, and I think the whole idea of limits is that we should be celebrating limits, not, um, not kind of like being afraid of, of limits. So. All right, so some take home. I think that uh, the, the networks that are behind all this that can lead to autocatalysis and positive feedback and mutualism is very real. Uh, we're dealing with dynamic systems, so it's important to look for trajectories and patterns that emerge from them. We're not just finding final solutions. Collapse is a part of the dynamic that can give new openings. Um, an agency that does occur has to do it within these biophysical limits. So, so I, I will always come back to that, that, that any, any social sciences solution that is inconsistent with the laws of thermodynamics will ultimately fail. Um, and I think that these collective actions you know, should be clumsy, right? That we are inv involving as many of the different, at least the different typologies that, that we have. So. Now I'll come back to this again, how we can actually manage and encourage and promote self-organizing systems.
But um, okay, that was all I had. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, so I have one. Uh, so this um, interesting result of uh, the agreements, uh, I mean, the, the agreements on concrete measures, mm -hmm. but this agreement on uh, moral values, I mean, uh, does this uh, uh, come from a different perspective, uh, perception of reality of the problem, or does this come from a, a different, uh, say, uh, value that we attach to the same, that people attach to the same perception. Yeah, I'm not sure that we, we asked them like that, but I would think it's more the second one. I think it's, it's I think they all recognize the problem, but their priority of, of how they view it is, is different. So it's, it's probably more along those lines. Thanks. Thomas? I should see if I can integrate all this. <clears throat> So is your view kind of hierarchist, but also, hold on, okay. but also one that takes into account this sort of Pauline cycle such that you expect some capriciousness in the environment, and so therefore you want to invite, you said views, but I'm guessing in a way it's sort of like inviting noise into the system so that you explore different possibilities and then you hopefully rise up to a new trajectory. So I'm trying to figure out what yeah, your yeah, actual view is here. Yeah, yeah, excellent, Well put. I think that inviting noise into the system is a good way to put it. Like, again, Holling was big in adaptive management, and you poke the system, and even if you know what's working, you sometimes try something different just to see how it's going to respond to that. So I think that is part of it. Um, and, and I think this idea of being, the, the cycle, though, is preparing you for, for the, for the darker days or the collapse part of that and how you, how you come out of that. So, so I think that, um, I th yeah, integrating all of that into one, one story, which I tried to do, I probably missed something. I, I think I'm pretty clear diet in the wool egalitarian, though. And it's funny, when I have my students do these surveys, and like the, it's an environmental science class, so most of them are that. And they're like shocked. How could somebody answer these questions another way? I say, take it to the business college, and they do, and they answer the questions completely differently. And so we're coming at it from these different perspectives. So, so you have to, you, you can't solve it with just one perspective. Right? You can't solve it with your own words. Thanks. Uh, um, so while uh, Giacomo uh, puts the, the slides, uh, then we have yes. another question. <coughs> time for my question. Who has the microphone? Okay. Um, I like, uh, um, I appreciate how you are separating um, how we think about what will happen and what will happen. Um, but when you got to the models, which I think were predictions about what will happen, um, could you say a little bit more about how that goes from what people think and <coughs> to what actually will happen? I didn't understand that transition. Um, like it, I, it, it, the different points of view were going to lead to some actual outcome. Was that what people think right. will happen? Right. In that particular case, it was happen? like if, if the whole, if everybody in that community, in that coastal town were thinking like an individualist and they managed the system like an individualist, we programmed in priorities of they would disvalue ecosystem services and they would upvalue the, the social benefits perhaps. And so that, that, that would be, that was imposed in the model. Then the, the other scenario was, what if everybody were an, individual, were an egalitarian and they managed it to maximize ecosystem services? So, so that was, the, the model result was essentially um, if that one was a homogeneous controller of those resources. So it was not, it wasn't the clumsy solution that I talked about. It was looking at the, at the, um, the space of solutions for the different worldviews. But it, it's still going to project. But somehow you have to translate w their attitude into some concrete weighting um, factors outcome. in the model. Yeah, yeah. And so, how do you do that? Um, like expert opinion. I mean, we 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 kind of brainstormed it. We got some feedback on it, and and just kind of based on on what you would expect from the theory of how these. The, I mean, there is a lot published on how those different groups interact with with nature. I see, because that so, seems like the really important step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair question. Okay. I'd be glad to talk more about it. But okay, maybe. Uh, so can we have just one question? Uh, uh, 
thank you for very nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you a question regarding with cultural theory. Uh, the, in, in the slide that you present, there is a part of the feedback at the end that you pass very quickly, feedback, positive feedback. Yeah. And I am interested in to see a little bit more relation with the, with the, with the right. student and how is the perception of the world. Their idea was the fact that once you have a particular worldview, you tend to socialize with other people with the same worldview, and that reinforces it. So there's a positive feedback. So you get this segregation, you get this separation that occurs. Now, again, like I said, this is, this is obvious to us now because of social media, that we all go to the same, we, we only hear from people that are, are like-minded. But back in the 90s, when everyone was reading the same newspapers and watching the same television, it was maybe a little harder to do that. So, so, so I think now we, we, we clearly see that there is that positive feedback that you, if, if you have a certain idea, you want to read and talk to people that have the same ideas. And that only strengthens your idea, so then you become more, more rigid that way. So, yeah. OK, so let's thank again uh, Brian. And um, now we have uh, 